where was Jesus? Right? And we were kind of making a distinction. <coughs> now we establish that Jesus has existed when? Before Genesis. Always, right? Before always. Genesis. He's always existed, right? Now, we were talking about we don't know exactly how it works. We talk about God and, and the existence of Jesus. And Jesus, as John says, Jesus is God. And then, so the question that was that I asked is, where was Jesus in like the whole Old Testament? Like, where did he exist? Where was he? And then we made two distinctions. Where do we make the distinctions of? Is there... There's an angel. There's an angel. The angel. And the angel. And the angel, right? And the angel. And there's a very big difference between and, I'm sorry, and, and the, or the, right? You can be a man, or you can be the man, right? Very, two different things. So, when we look at the Old Testament, there's a clear distinction of an angel and the angel, right? And we made a very clear distinction. And today we'll start with Exodus, just to start there, and then we'll, we'll look at the angel by himself. So, Go to Exodus 13, 21. So let's actually, let's read 21. So let's start with that, Exodus 13. And read, uh, let's start at 17. So, and check this out, right? Kind of like the same thing we were talking about last time. I'm going to read it, Elmer. Um, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near for God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness towards the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Okay, Moses, then go ahead and read 21. Uh, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. All right, now, let's go to 14. 19. Go ahead and read it, Elmer. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved, sprung before them, and stood behind them. Alright, so where was... So we see a clear distinction that in 13 it says that God was in front, or led them, right? Mm -hmm. Led them. And then verse... This is 13. And then 14 it says what? What does it say? Who was in the front? Uh, the angel, okay? So, for some reason, it's either one of two things. Either, like, in Genesis or the Old Testament, there is a contradiction of what's actually happening, or there's a contradiction of who is where, and the Bible's contradicting itself, or well, all of a sudden, what John says, um, what John says, 1-1, one, one, it starts to make sense. What does John 1-1 one, one say? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we have Father, God the Father, and God the Son. So if we look at this, if we look at 13 and 14, all of a sudden, Genesis 1-1, one, one, when we talk about the angel in the Old Testament, this kind of makes sense of why this would make sense. You understand that? Does it make sense? No? Yes? Okay. So let's look at this the angel. Genesis, Genesis 16, chapter 16, verse 7 to 10. I'm going to read it, David. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the mistress Sarai. Sarai. To what? To ten. Uh, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for multitude. All right, so they look, look, so we have the angel of the Lord and we have who else? There's two characters here. Hagar. Hagar. Who's Hagar, Elmer? Uh, the servant. Who's servant? Uh, Abraham's. Uh, I mean, servant. 
Sarah serpent, good, okay? So what happened to Hagar? What's the problem? Who knows? She's pregnant. She's well, pregnant? She, yeah, she's pregnant with uh, Abraham. Abraham's uh, son. Right. And does Sarah like that? No. So what happened? Kicked her out. You gotta go. Okay? Hagar was did not know her place. So she leaves and the angel of the Lord appears to her. Okay? The, the angel appears to her and, and he says, near the spring of the desert, and there was beside the road of shirt, and he said, Hagar servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And he, she says, I'm running from my mistress, she answered. And the angel of the Lord says, go back to your mistress and what? What does it say? Submit. Submit to her. Verse 10. And the angel of the Lord added, I will also increase your descendants that will be too numerous to count. So the angel of the, road, of the Lord is doing what? What is he saying? And his authority. He's, he's giving some sort of authority. He's saying, I will also increase your descendants that will too be numerous to count. Now, in no context of the Bible has an angel or a regular angel that presented itself ever spoken on its own authority. But in this particular verse, the angel of the Lord says, I will also increase your descendants that will be too numerous, too numerous to count. And then verse 11, he kind of like, um, it's, it's kind of like her blessing in a sense. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son. And you shall name him Ishmael. Um, for the Lord has heard your misery, and he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. So the angel of the Lord has taken it. It seems like he's taken it upon himself to tell her that he is going to increase her descendants it seems, and by what we can read, it's on his own authority. Okay, we'll see other verses where he says things that are not on his authority, but he speaks as to what God says. But in this particular verse, he's speaking on his own authority. Now, next verse, Zechariah. Book of Zechariah. Go ahead and read it. Uh, Carlos. Uh, just beginning on three? Yeah, one through three. Uh, then he showed me... Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side. Right, so who do we have? The angel of the Lord. We have the angel of the Lord, and who else do we have? Satan. Satan, and who else do we have? Joshua. Joshua, the high priest. Okay. So the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now read from 4 to 6. So he spoke to those standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to him, See, I have removed your guilt from you, and I will clothe you with splendid robes. Okay. Who said that? The angel. The angel said what? He will clothe him. What, what does he say he takes away from him? Some of your versions, in my version, says I will remove your sins from you. Mm -hmm. Right? I will remove your guilt from you. Who forgives sins? Jesus. If we look at the Old Testament context, I'm sorry, the New Testament context, the only one who forgives sins is Jesus. In the Old Testament, the forgiveness of sins or the, the transfer of sins is given through a wild animal, through the sacrifice of an animal, in which the animal takes the sin and God, therefore, the sin is taken on the animal and the animal dies. So the sin is it's, it, it's transferred in a sense, but if we look at it in the context of the New Testament, the only one who forgives sins is Jesus. He takes upon the sins, he forgives the sins. He says, and when he was healing people, he says, your sins are forgiven, right? It's, he's the only one. And in this context, in Zechariah, the angel of the Lord says, I have taken away your guilt. Some version says, I have taken away your sin." Okay, it's, it's becoming a little more clear because, first of all, the Lord's speaking, and all of a sudden, like the angel of the Lord is speaking, and the angel of the Lord says, I will take away your filth, I will take away your guilt, I will take away your sin. 
Okay, so there is authority in this angel. Okay, this angel has some sort of authority. Like it's obvious. Okay, that he has something that of authority of his own authority that he speaks on. But he's also very impressive. So let's go to 2 Kings chapter 19. Rob, go to Isaiah 37, 36. So, 2 Kings 19, 35. Charles, read it. That night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Adrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. How many? 185,000. What does Isaiah say, Rob? Uh, and the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Syrians. People rose early in the morning. Behold, these are all dead bodies. So, this isn't just like a regular like angel. This isn't a regular being. This is, I mean, you think about it. It's 185,000 men. How many people fit in a stadium? Approximately. How many does Levi's Stadium hold? About 30 grand? 30,000? 25,000 people? Right? I'm talking 185,000 in the camp that this angel of the Lord took out. That's Gilroy. That's. No, I think Gilroy has 158,000. Close. So, yeah, but you're close. Yeah. How can you imagine that? We're not talking about some simple being. We're not talking about some simple individual. We, we're talking about a being with authority and, and who's, who's obviously a warrior, a fighter of some sense, with, with obviously just an incredible being. And we're not talking about just anything or anyone. This, this is significant. This is someone of, of a lot of importance, of a lot of authority. Okay? Um... Uh, the angel of the Lord is mentioned in the Old Testament, it's mentioned 53 times. As it is, the angel of the Lord. Specific to the angel of the Lord. It's, it's, it's completely um, isolated in, in the way that he speaks, in the way that he acts, and in the things that he says. It's very specific to the way that the angel of the Lord acts says or um, the authority that he takes upon himself is very specific and very different than most angels that you will see or anyone or when you see an angel um go ahead um, um i see i see your your points i'm just having a hard time relating this attribute to jesus what? taking out a bunch of people Mm. Yeah. Why? Because it doesn't sound like Jesus. Oh. <laughs> I mean, not the, not the man that. Right. That the was, Prince of Peace, yeah. right? Yeah. And 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 here's and here's the interesting part, right? Here, and I've been strong, I've been I've been thinking about this. Glad you brought it up. Um. If we think about Jesus and Jesus' ministry in the New Testament, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus actually um, humble with? The sinners. The sinners. What about everyone else? I mean, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He was harsh. Yeah. I mean, he, he he just didn't care about them. He just he just told him whatever he wanted to tell him. There was no, it seems almost with, with Jesus in his ministry, there was no, um, no compassion for them. I mean, even in the temple, right, when he went in and he uh, took everybody out, he just started flipping tables and, and hitting people. Um, that's very different from the attribute of who God is. Or, or when the woman comes and it says that she asks, she asked Jesus and Jesus uh, for a miracle, and Jesus says, "Will I will will 
will I give my bread to the dogs? And she says, no, but the crumbs of the table, even the dogs will feed off of them, right? It doesn't sound very Jesus-like at all. There are some attributes of Jesus that we, we look at. We look at the Father in the Old Testament, and God the Father in the Old Testament is harsh. I mean, he, he is tough. I mean, when, when, the, when the, the Israelites went into Canaan and they took over, he says, I want you to destroy them all. Like children, like kids, women, all of them. I don't want nobody to be alive. They all have to die. I mean, that in itself doesn't sound very Christian. Right? It doesn't. So, but when we look at Jesus and we look at God, and if we look at it in this sense, then this kind of makes sense. Right? Kind of makes sense. When, when I look at Jesus' peacefulness, when I look at his meekness, when I look at um, his humbleness, I only see that, that Jesus is, is, is very serving and, and, and humble to those that he means to save. And it's always the sinners, those who have been um, separated, those who have been oppressed. It's never those who are doing the oppressing or those who are lying. It's like he almost has no interest in saving them because there is no heart for them or the... They show no heart of being humbled or, or, or wanting to know who he is. And I, I've, been, I've been looking at that, and this kind of makes sense to me when I look at it in that sense. And also when I see God the Father of the Old Testament, he was, he, he was tough, man. Yeah, it, was, it just wasn't easy. Um, interesting enough, right? Um, go to Matthew 124. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the last time the angel of the Lord is mentioned in this, this particular verse. This is the last time. He's not mentioned in the New Testament anymore. The last time he's mentioned is when he comes... And he tells Joseph, Joseph, he's <laughs> like he's saying, um, go back to Mary, um, because uh, this is this is godly, right? And and we don't hear the angel of the Lord any time after this. This is the extent of it. Now, is it coincidence? So Jesus isn't born yet. Right? Jesus is, is, is yet to be born, but yet we have uh, the angel of the Lord that appears to Joseph, and he says, Joseph, go back to Mary because what's about to happen is a godly thing, and the angel of the Lord is no longer mentioned throughout the whole New Testament. It's the last time. So then the question then is, who is the angel of the Lord? Or who does the angel of the Lord represent, right? That's the question. Now, in my, this is my personal opinion, and this is what I believe. I'm not sure what you're going to gather from this, but who is the angel of the Lord? It's Jesus. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. The angel of the Lord is Jesus. Jesus has always existed. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So where was Jesus in the Old Testament? Where was he at creation? Well, John says everything was created through him, and if not, not by him, nothing would have been created. So Jesus is at creation. He exists in Genesis 1-1 because everything was created through him. And then we look at the whole Old Testament, and we see that the angel of the Lord is mentioned 53 times throughout the whole Old Testament, and the authority that he has and the capabilities that he has sets him apart from any other angel. So who else or who else can speak with such authority to forgive sins, to bless, um, and to even bless Hagar's line uh, lineology, the angel of the Lord, and that all roads point to Jesus. That is who the angel of the Lord is. This is a very personal opinion, okay? Uh, there are 
a lot who would agree with me, but this is personal. Well, there are some who don't. Um, precisely this verse here in uh, Matthew 1, I, I'm reading before, I'm starting off at uh, verse 18. And one thing I do see is, uh, it says, it's starting about the birth of Jesus. Um, and then it says that an angel appeared to him while he was sleeping. And when he woke up, uh, he said that he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. So we're talking about the same angel, but one says an angel of the Lord. You said 18? Uh, no, it says, let me look for it, uh, 20. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream. So we're talking about an angel, but when he wakes up, he says that he did what that angel told him to do. But verse 24 says mm -hmm. the Lord's angel. So it's well, it's well, it is confusing because one appears in the dream, right? One is in the dream, one appears in reality. So, I mean, could it be the same one or could it be two separate ones, right? I mean, it's it's debatable. Yeah, Luke, uh, Luke, Luke says Gabriel met Mary and then an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. So, yeah, it kind of yeah. interchanges a little bit. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the but this, and you're right. It, it is we, we can we can debate it, right? Like whether it is because it is interchangeable. Yeah, and it is. So the only thing is, and what's very curious about it, it's the last time it's mentioned. That's what makes it very interesting, and and what, why I consider we can apply it because it's the last time that this is used, and that makes it very interesting. Like why? Why is it that once Jesus is born, that doesn't exist anymore? Right. So, questions. Over. What you think? You don't know. Have you ever heard this? No. Okay. What do you think about it? Huh? Talk to me, man. What do you think? It's different. It's odd. It's weird. It's don't really. It's not really taught. So, what do you think? Nothing. <laughs> All right. No comments. Okay. So, with that said, if we accept the idea. Or if you decide to accept the idea, all right, that what John says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, then we have just accepted the idea that John Marwan is talking about this in a sense. It's referring to God the Father and God the Son, and Jesus is God, and uh, but it's two entities or. Uh, two, yeah, two entities in one. It's two in one, which is still one God. It's not. We're not polytheistic, okay? We're monotheistic, meaning that we believe in one God. We believe in one God that's composed of two natures, Father and Father and Son. We know that He existed. That Jesus existed since Genesis one. Because everything was created through him, and if not by him, nothing would have been created. And in the Old Testament, we can assume in the sense that he was referred to as the angel of the Lord. So he's always existed since the very beginning of time. John 1, Genesis, and the Old Testament. He's always been there. Uh, Jesus isn't something that was created. It was, wasn't something that he began to exist in the New Testament. Jesus has always been there. Okay? So now we get into the New Testament. Okay? Does anybody know, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, how much time elapsed? 400 years. It's approximately believe it's between 400 to 450 years. Do you know what this time is called? 
Huh? Apostasy? No. No. Something no. silent or something. He almost got it. It's when you the don't dark get any, ages? <laughs> when you don't get any revelation. Technically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like the arrow or the arrow or the great arrow or something of silence. Why is it called that? Because God didn't communicate with nobody. Because there was zero communication between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There was nothing. Okay, nothing. God did not reveal himself. God did not speak. There was nothing that was revealed. There was no prophets. It was a great silence. La era del gran silencio, as they call it in Spanish. Okay, there was about 400 or 450 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament because God cut out. There was nothing. Nothing until we come to the book of um, technically the first book is Mark. Okay, Mark is technically the first book written, okay. um, and we have that God appears or the angel appears to Mary okay, and begins the ministry of Jesus. Christ. Okay. Man, 100%. Divine, 100%. There begins the ministry of Jesus Christ. Okay. We'll get into his ministry starting next week. But there's something that I want to address first. And I want to address the... Um, the historical context and belief of Jesus Christ, that his existence is irrefutable, not by just biblical terms, but by secular history. That Jesus exists outside the Bible. That Jesus, um, his existence um, can be proven. It exists not just because the Bible says so, because historical context in Europe, um, Western civilization, historical context is evidence that Jesus exists. It's irrefutable. His existence is irrefutable. Like no one can like tell you that he did not exist because um, it's just there's overwhelming evidence for his existence, and not just biblical context, not just the Bible, secular history. Okay, we'll start that next week. Questions, comments. No, I think we're a little early. Yep. Play this out, Rob.